All right, hi everyone. Thank you for coming to our first press conference. This is Forecasting Fisheries. Our participants are Phoebe Wordworth Jeffcoats, um, a research oceanographer at, the, at NOAA in uh, Honolulu, Kathy Mills from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, Dale Kiefer from the University of Southern California, and Hiromichi Igarashi from um, Jamstack in Japan. All right, Phoebe's going to start us off. All right. Just start over? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I'm Phoebe, and um, just to give you again a quick overview of what we looked at, we used a suite of 11 climate models and found strong agreement among these models. They all gave similar projections. And the models project rising upper ocean temperatures and declining zooplankton densities under a business as usual climate change scenario. And this suggests that the North Pacific ecosystems might not be able to support as many large commercially valuable fish. And that we project this capacity to decline by 2 to 5% per decade over the century or by 20 to 50% by the end of the 21st century. Um, and that also the species distribution over space might change as a result of warming temperatures. So I can step through these more specifically. So the first thing we looked at is the potential change in the number of large fish that the North Pacific can support, and we call this carrying capacity. And we project that it will decline due to rising ocean temperatures and declining zooplankton densities. And the reason is that as the ocean gets warmer, fish need to eat more. It raises their metabolism, and they need to find more food to match that higher metabolic rate. However, at the same time that it's supposed to be getting warmer, we actually project there'll be lower zooplankton densities, so less zooplankton. And zooplankton are a foundational force, a source of food in the food web, and they can be indicative of food available to fish. So as the ocean gets warmer and fish need more food, they'll actually have less available to eat. So this reduces the ocean's ability as a whole to support as many large fish. And then we also looked at the spatial distribution of tuna and billfish species in the North Pacific, and we call this species richness. And we project this to change spatially as a result of warming temperatures. And so this is because fish have specific temperatures they like to be in, and when the temperatures change, the fish will relocate to stay in the environment that they want to be in. So what we found is in the subtropical latitudes, it starts to get too warm for these fish, and some species just can't survive in those higher temperatures. And we project that some species will leave those waters. And then to the opposite effect is further north, where right now it's a little too cool for some of these tropical species, it will start to get warmer and more hospitable for them. And so in the subtropics, a decline of three to four tuna and billfish species might not seem like a lot. However, the fisheries that operate in these areas are really targeting just a small handful of fish, like big eye and skipjack tuna and swordfish. So changing the species composition by just a few species can have a large impact on the composition and the magnitude of their catch. And in fact, we've seen there's um, some fishermen that home port in Honolulu, they've actually been shifting their home port to San Francisco just as their catch moves. It puts them closer to their fishing grounds. So finally, to put this all together, uh, we found that due to rising ocean temperatures and declining zooplankton density, we project that the North Pacific ecosystem will not be able to support as many large fish over the coming decades, declining by 2 to 5 percent per decade, and that the geographic distribution of species catch may change, and that we project that the subtropics will be particularly hard hit by these changes by seeing some of the greatest declines in carrying capacity and also declines of commercially valuable billfish and tuna species. So with that, I'll turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hi, I'm Kathy Mills. I'm from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and I'm going to be describing for you today forecasts that we are developing to um, forecast the timing of the start of Maine's lobster fishery each year. This is um, an overview of, of a poster um, with these co-authors that I'll be presenting this evening. Um, so the motivation for this forecast came during 2012 when we experienced a large ocean heat wave across the northwest Atlantic. So in 2012, temperatures from Iceland up into the Labrador Sea and all the way down to Cape Hatteras were running about 1 to 3 degrees Celsius warmer than the long-term average. This puts them on par with what climate models project us to see by the end of the century. And the ramifications of this um, were multifaceted. So one um, 
ramification or one impact that we're particularly interested in was it shifted the annual cycle of temperature. So we came into 2012 very warm. The spring warmed early relative to when you typically experience warming in the spring and then it stayed warm longer and temperatures declined later in the fall. And it's really this early warming in the spring that we're interested in. So temperatures warmed up about three weeks early and the lobster fishery in Maine is very cued by temperature in a couple of ways through the biology of lobsters. So you rely on temperature for lobsters to molt into a legal size where they can be caught. And also temp warming temperatures means the lobsters are more active and are out and about and more likely to enter into lobster traps. So the landings also ramped up very early that year. And this resulted in high volume of landings coming in before the processors and um, transporters were able to prepare for that onslaught and so it created a glut of product on the market and that led to a major price collapse. Prices were down to $1.25 at one point during the summer. So um, we realized from this event that um, there was there would be some advantage to knowing when the fishery was likely to start. One of the big things that happened in 2012 was just that there was not the transportation capacity lined up and the processors which are in Canada for the most part um, actually were mostly closed down to retrofit for the soft shell product that comes in from Maine. And so had they known even just a few weeks earlier that this would be the case, they could have prepared for this. And so we've been developing a forecast since then of when we expect the lobster fishery to really tick up for the summer um, relative to its normal uptick around the 4th of July. So this is our forecast from last year. We um, predict this in a probabilistic way so we can assign some probability to whether we expect it to be normal, late, very late, or early. Um, and we do this um, first by defining a start date. So these are what we mean when we talk about start dates. In warm years, the start of the fishery really ramps up sooner than it does in cooler years. Just to give you some inside um, insights into how our forecast works, we define a start date using a piecewise regression to set this point where we say the fishery actually started. Then we use um, temperature data recorded from four buoys in the Gulf of Maine that are part of the Niracous array. We take the 50 meter temperatures and relate those to the start date. And through this regression model, we're able to predict when we expect an out of sample year to start based on temperatures that we see during the spring. We actually have um, the highest predictive capacity from mid-March through late April, so we can give about three or four months of an early warning in terms of when we expect the fishery to tick up. And we issue this forecast over multiple weeks so we can track and users can also see how the forecast is changing with temperatures as they change in the spring. Our next forecast for this year will be available starting next week. This is our website, gmri.org lobster forecast. And these are what temperatures are looking like right now. So we see sea surface temperature anomalies in the region that are running quite warm, um, between one and two and a half degrees warmer than we typically expect. So we have another warm year coming up. Um, if you look at this relative to 2012, the blue is sort of, the black is the long-term mean, the annual cycle over multiple years when the buoys have been in the water. The blue is sort of the, the max and min around that. You can see in 2012 we were very warm and in 2016 we're right here. So we're very close to what temperatures were looking like in 2012. And our goal with this is to really provide information to multiple facets of the fishery from harvesters to dealers, transporters, and processors. And um, I just want to thank our funders. Our funding for this largely comes from NASA and also from NSF and with support from Maine DMR for the um, data that we use. So thank you. I'm Hiromichi Igarashi from Jams Tech Japan. Uh, this is uh, today. I'd like to talk about the uh, uh, forecasting system of the neon flying squid. Uh, first of all, I'd like to summarize my talk. We have developed an uh, um, operational prediction system of potential fishing zone of neon flying squid in the Central North Pacific. This uh, uh, that composed uh, three components: uh, ocean reanalysis dataset, Fora and the ocean data simulation system, squids, 
and habitat suitability index model for neon flying squid. We provided the daily squid HSI forecast to the Japanese commercial vessels in operation last summer. And the results uh, shows that uh, information of the HSI forecast uh, has the potential to contribute to saving the fuel cost of vessels and leads to uh, stabilization of fishery management. Uh, our target is a neon flying squid. Uh, this is widely distributed in the North Pacific and uh, uh, it plays an important role for Japanese commercial fisheries. Uh, the fishing, of, uh, fishing ground of, uh, an, uh, of the Japanese commercial vessels in summer is located in around the dateline in summer. And this, is, this area is a target of this study. And for the uh, accurate estimate of the potential fishing zone of neon flying squid, we developed a habitat suitability index model for neon flying squid. Uh, this is widely used as a tool for ecological impact assessment and describes the relationship between the squid abundance and uh, ocean environmental variables, such as sea surface temperature, sea surface height, and so on, and estimates the level of habitat suitability as an HSI score. Uh, for forecasting squid HSI, uh, first we, have, we developed a HSI model for neon flying squid by using a squid catch data and the ocean environmental uh, uh, data set in the past, and then the uh, ocean data simulation, data simulation and forecast system were developed. By applying the HSI model to the forecast, ocean forecast fields, we can predict the HSI of neon flying squid. Uh, here, uh, we use the FOLA data set as an o ocean environmental data set and the squids uh, for the real-time prediction. Uh, uh, JAMSTEC and the uh, Meteorological Research Institute have produced a new 4D bar ocean reanalysis data set, FOLA. FOLA is a four-dimensional variational ocean reanalysis uh, calculated by the DR simulator. Uh, this is the first ever data set uh, covering the Western North Pacific. Uh, for three decades uh, at the uh, eddy dissolving resolution. So the major ocean current, uh, such as uh, Kuroshio and Oyashio, and associated uh, uh, ocean mesoscale uh, phenomena, such as eddies or fronts and the meanders, are uh, well reproduced, finely reproduced in this data set. We use this data set for uh, developing the uh, HSI model for neon flying squid. And then uh, we also uh, developed a new data simulation system for the real-time ocean forecast of the fishing ground of neon flying squid uh, called SQUIDS, Scalable Kit of under the end Undersea Information Delivery System. Uh, this lower panel shows the example of the ocean forecast fields of the 300 meter depth temperature. Uh, uh, from the such uh, ocean forecast fields, we can pick up the uh, seven ocean environmental variables uh, and input to the HSI model and draw the daily HSI map of the neon flying squid. And, uh, uh, Real-time ocean forecast data set uh, calculated by the Earth simulator uh, is, uh, were uh, uh, immediately uh, loaded to the cloud server uh, for HSI mapping, and then uh, it, uh, quickly delivered to the uh, Japanese commercial fishing vessels by using a satellite telecommunication. Uh, fishermen can uh, access the website and browse the latest uh, fields of the ocean forecast and the uh, squid HSI map. And on, in addition, the squid researchers uh, on land can monitor the real-time feedback data of a daily catch and fishing point of each vessel reported from the fishermen using the website. Uh, so the two-way communication between fishermen and the researchers effectively works for searching next fishing point. So this uh, web uh, service can uh, help the fishermen to find a good fishing point quickly without wasteful movement, uh, and uh, this uh, leads to uh, saving a fuel cost. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to introduce the Fora dataset is now available. Uh, please access this site and uh, use this dataset, and uh, please find the related poster presentation. 
Thank you. I'm uh, Dale Kiefer from the University of Southern California. Uh, and with support from uh, NASA and the National Science Foundation, uh, I've developed uh, with my collaborators listed there a um, geographic information system that we hope can be applied to um, the tuna fishery of the eastern trop tropical Pacific Ocean. Um, this is a big, a huge fishery covering thousands, thousands of square kilometers of the o ocean surface, and I'll show you the location. Uh, and it's heavily exploited by something like 12 nations. Um, the products range from high-grade sushi to tuna fish sandwiches for Americans and to cat food. So it's very diverse uh, and, um, and it needs, because of the large area, it's very hard to monitor, but we have a 50-year data set to work with um, producing a product much like we just heard. Let's see, I guess we go. So this is a quick, uh, description of the um, information system. It's called a pelagic habitat analysis module. Uh, you merge fisheries data, which is reported to the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission uh, on a monthly basis with a one degree resolution over this vast area. Uh, we can take tagging data. These uh, large fish are, can be tagged with electronic tags and logged and find out how they're swimming, where they're swimming. Uh, we uh, use satellite imagery, a range of satellite imagery that, that you'll see, and we're using the NASA's ECHO-2 uh, global circulation model. All of this is put into a geographic information system and subject to statistical analyses uh, leading to maps, dynamic maps uh, of habitat, a little bit what you just, just saw. So uh, the amazing thing uh, that we, I think that uh, I, occurred to me was that when we looked at the data from satellites, which you see in the upper figure, this is a, fig this is an, uh, a sea surface chlorophyll concentration from a global satellite. Uh, and you see the little uh, squares associated with it. That's the, uh, the area where the fishermen are fishing. Uh, it is this a, a Persane fisherman from, that catch skipjack, yellowfin, and big-eye tuna. Uh, and you can see that it's perfectly described by the chlorophyll concentration. That is, the more productive waters uh, define that fishery's uh, habitat. So right off the bat, we know the linkage between fisheries and oceanographic conditions. The, second, the lower figure shows you the same uh, information about the fishing grounds. But now we're uh, superimposing it on pot, upon uh, a layer of oxygen depleted water. At a, this is the concentration of oxygen at 125 meters. And we can see that, uh, again, that um, the fishing ground is well defined by this absence of oxygen uh, in the lower waters. And uh, the idea here, the hypothesis is that we're pursuing in our calculations is that when you put a low, when you bring oxygen to pour water close to the surface, it traps the fish and their prey into a much narrower uh, water column. You, these fish are generally, and, and their prey, uh, make vertical migrations down the depths of almost 1,000 meters at times. Uh, and by the fact that the prey, the tuna, uh, is trapped to the waters above this layer, uh, it makes good hunting for the tuna. Unfortunately, it makes good hunting for humans uh, because they, uh, the fish are now tra also trapped into a depth of the water column where they can use their nets to capture those tuna. So it's an extremely uh, rich habitat. The technology used by the fishermen probably far exceeds the scientific technology. They use satellite imagery, they use, uh, they use uh, helicopters from their vessels, they use very advanced sonar systems to spot the schools of fish, uh, and they are revolutionizing the fishery and, and actually pose a major danger because they're using these fish aggregation devices. Thousands of floats are out in this water. Uh, the fish aggregate around those floats, bringing some of the fish like big eye tuna near the surface where they can be caught for the first time in the last 20 years. They're now caught at rates that are about 100 times greater than they were before the use of these fish aggregation devices. We're providing this software for conservation purposes, um, but the truth of the matter is it could be turned around and used as a means for exploiting that population. Uh, another discovery was we take time series information from satellite imagery and we subject it to a statistical analysis called 
EOF, empirical orthogonal function analysis. That's not important. But it takes large time series of satellite imagery and breaks it into components that account for the variability. The upper figure uh, shows you the seasonal cycle. This is a map of the lar of places where they have the largest vari variation in temperature. And you can see the seasonal once a year cycle uh, in that upper right hand panel. The lower panel is a second type of analysis, same, same sort of analysis with a special application. This tells you the, uh, the non-seasonal dynamics, which is the El Nino and La Nina in the first mode. So uh, the, the high peaks are show you the, when El Nino occurred, and the minimum values are the La Nina periods. And it turns out that when you study the, or examine the data, that's shown in the next slide, We've discovered that we can actually predict for yellowfin tuna the recruitment of the young fish by looking at this transition between El Nino and La Nina. It's the first time, I think that, uh, I believe it's the first time that anyone has, has found a clear environmental signal that can be used for uh, assessing the recruitment of young fish into the adult populations. Uh, that uh, capability, well here's the, uh, the red line is the predictions from satellites, the blue line is the classical assessment of the stock of recruits. And uh, it takes two years to produce one at, at costs of a million dollars or more a year to produce it. Our information comes free of charge from, uh, with, the, with the analysis, uh, free of charge, almost uh, real-time information about uh, recruitment. Uh, these are the last two slides. Uh, you can, we can actually watch uh, in the data the movement of the fishery as it responds to events like El Nino and La Nina. So in the figure we have a plot of sea surface height that was mentioned earlier. Uh, this tells you the ocean actually has hills and valleys, and these hills and valleys drive the circulation patterns including eddies which are critical to the, the fish and the fishermen. Uh, and then we, we plot in our, using our software, you, we put in little floaters and the trails you see, those long lines uh, show you the movement of the surface water uh, over a six month period. This is the El Nino event, and you'll notice that uh, the fishery, this is this catch of skipjack tuna put in color code, and the points where they catch the fish are shown as little dots. Where they caught a lot of fish are red dots, few fish are, are black dots, and you can see that there's a general dispersion. The fleet is, is confused because of the changes in the currents, the uh, cr counter current. Uh, has collapsed, the main equatorial current has collapsed, and the north equatorial current has collapsed. When El Nino kicks in, which is when we have the peak in recruitment, the fishery thrives. You can see now that all the boats are lined up at about five degrees north, parallel to the equator, and you can see that blue mark. That is where uh, these special waves, ge uh, ge geoplanetary waves, uh, form eddies, or are eddies, that pump nutrient-rich water, very productive water up to the surface, and the fishermen are exploiting that information and catching lots of fish along this, this line that, that's uh, shown there. So now we have a very much higher catch. You notice much more red, m many more red dots. And, uh, and so we're starting to get a feeling of how this, how this, this uh, system operates. A critical point is that often they'll have to close the fishery because of overcatch. This gives the fishing managers an opportunity to see how, where they want to close the, the, the fishery. It doesn't do any good to close a region where they aren't catching fish. So this allows them to target uh, decision making. I finish just, um, if you have questions, um, my name is Dale Kiefer. This is my email address, my cell phone number if you want to talk to me soon. Uh, and this is one of our websites uh, called, um, where we, we advertise the software, which is made available to scientists for free. Um, it's called the runeasy.com website. Okay. Okay. Do we have any questions from reporters in the room? Mm -hmm. 
I'm Patricia Tummins with Environment Hawaii. And I, I have a concern because on the one hand, in Phoebe's talk, we, you know, we heard about the depletion of fish. And then in the talk from Mr. Igarashi, Igarashi we heard about the special you know, jet age information that's being used to target fish that might possibly be the prey species for the larger fish. It seems there's a kind of cross purposes here. I mean, at what point should science back away from supporting exploitative industries? Um, I mean, I don't know what the status is of the neon flying squid. I don't know what the MSY is, what the catch rate or anything is that of the neon flying squid. But I would imagine that it's one of the prey species that's used by big eye or the billfish that are the larger commercially valuable species. Could you kind of address that? Um, I see it as a tension. Thank you. Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I can, um, sure. You ask an extremely difficult question that involves politics as well as science, as you know. The, in fact, many of the scientific, uh, so in defense of science, which generally doesn't need to be defended in my opinion, but generally uh, the scientists uh, provide advice on all of these fisheries, or the ones that I think we've talked about, uh, and in many cases that information is ignored by uh, the people that actually negotiate with the fishing fleet, as you know well in Hawaii. So um, the, the, the industry is going to be out there. The question is, how do we have enough information that we can co conclusively tell the fishermen that we understand the system and they are uh, putting that resource in danger? So I don't think uh, canceling research will, will solve the problem. I think it will make it worse. And, and I don't think that's what you were... In. Uh, but the question you act, ask about um, interactions between predator and prey, yeah, very qu difficult questions. Um, we're sealing food from the major predators. We are the major predator on the planet. So um, that's a issue that's trying to be addressed with the thing called ecosystem-based management. It's been a code word throughout the world of, of saying, now let's not just look at single species operations, but let's look at the impact to the entire ecosystem. Well, it turns out that's a very difficult chore. That requires knowledge of uh, the, f it, t it requires full scientific knowledge from the productivity all the way up to the, 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 uh, the, the trophic levels, the different higher trophic levels. So it, I don't think the science in many cases isn't ready for e ecosystem-based management, but I think it's trying to take on the challenge, and I think it's, it's good. It's the, it's the answer to that, your type of question, uh, but um, a lot of scientists don't, the problem you have are scientists don't want to make any mistakes. We're, we're extremely conservative in the use of our information, I believe. Uh, so scientists are reluctant to, to speak, to tr address and say, uh, the squid, taking of squid is going to impact the tuna fishery. It, it probably does. The one thing you can say about squid is they have an extremely high reproductive rate. They are like the, the cockroaches of the ocean. So they have very high turnover. So uh, it seems uh, one can argue with that knowledge that we can uh, take a large, some fraction of the squid without negatively affecting the tuna fishery. But um, what we need is that type of information on the reproductive capacity of our, our carrying capacity, as, the, uh, as was discussed, and then apply that information and have the fishermen uh, conform or uh, accept the rules that uh, are really the information that's being handed down by, by scientists like the people on the panel. Okay, do we have any more more question, questions from reporters in the room? Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Emily DeMarco. I'm a science writer with Inside Science at the American Institute of Physics. Kathy, my question is for you. Um, if I understood correctly, you mentioned that your for forecast gives about three to four months of warning to the fish lobster industry. Is that enough time to respond? And can you help me understand a little bit, like, what's going on on the ground? Like, what are they doing to, to get ready? Yeah, exactly. Thank you for the question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we, as I mentioned, we have the highest predictive capacity between late March and mid to late April. And so basically we can make a forecast at that time that provides information for what will happen around early July. So we have, you know, two to three months in there that fishermen should have some sense of whether the season is going to start early, be about normal, or be late. On the ground, some of the things that are happening at that time is um, there are a couple of questions of how the timing, the uptick of the fishery will align with, for example, the big start of the tourist season in Maine. So when the lobster fishery ticks up really strongly around July 4th, you also have this influx of tourists to take up a lot of that initial product. Um, the other factor, and this came into play in 2012, is how it aligns with the Canadian fishing season. So um, in 2012, Canada was still fishing and bringing in lots of lobsters at the same time that the U.S. fishery ramped up. And typically they don't overlap, and that is per particularly for this purpose of trying to ensure the product is spread out and that there's not a big glut. Um, so we can't really control that piece, but um, what we can do is by providing early warning, for example, in 2012, had there been trucks to transport the product, had the dealers known three months ahead of time that there was likely to be a lot of volume coming in very early, they actually could have created different outlets for it as well. And then the processors also could have been more prepared. And so I think that, um, you know, the fishermen are kind of tracking on the water what's happening as it occurs. They're kind of monitoring for themselves how the lobsters are doing when they're really, um, when their activity levels are really ticking up. Um, but it, it, we see it as particularly valuable for those other steps in the supply chain. But then I've also talked to fishermen who use it for things like um, planning their boat payments and timing their boat payments. So if they know the season is going to start late, they'll negotiate with their lenders to make sure their payments aren't due before they expect the season to really start. So it does affect business decisions made by the harvesters as well. Sure. Is that helpful? It is, thank okay. you. Okay, any more questions? Anything on the web chat? 